Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, I'm Alex Pollock. It's my pleasure to welcome you to our conference on Are the Bubbles Back? Well, as we all know, the Federal Reserve, along with all the other major members of the Central Bank Club, uh, has given us interest rates uh, at previously unimaginably low levels for and kept them there a previously unimaginably long time. Also, needless to say, it's basic present value math that low discount rates make asset prices rise, and asset price inflation is indeed one of the goals uh, of the central banks. Very low int interest rates have another important effect. As Walter Badgett wrote 140 years ago, John Bull can stand anything, but he can't stand 2%. By that, Badgett meant that the thirst for yield tends to encourage financial mistakes. Uh, and if he thought 2% encourages mistakes, we'll have to wonder what Badgett would have thought about whether John Bull could stand one quarter of 1%. Uh, of course, asset price inflations make a lot of people happy while they last. Uh, but when does an asset price inflation become a bubble? Currently, we have a lot of asset classes to think about in this respect. Uh, houses uh, in this country and in others, uh, for example, Brazil, Canada, Hong Kong, and China, all are said to have house price bubbles at the moment. Uh, and both uh, Jay Brinkman and Chris Whalen will be addressing uh, the housing sector today. We can worry about stocks, bonds, especially junk bonds, along with leveraged loans and farmland, uh, which is a new topic to this series, uh, uh, with which both Mark Fogarty and Mark Carey are going to touch on today, as well as emerging markets, which Desmond Lockman will focus on. Uh, so uh, you can see our panel will enlighten us on some key sectors on this topic of asset price inflations and, and when they turn into bubbles. Uh, just uh, starting for the moment uh, with U.S. house prices, let me show you a couple of graphs. This is one. This is the Case-Shiller uh, House Price Index. It only started in 1987. Obviously, we see the bubble there. This has a trend line drawn through it, which is a trend from 1987 to 1999, which is when I think the bubble started. This uh, chart is interesting because it suggests that uh, following the bubble and the collapse and the recent uh, escalation in house prices, if you believe this trend line, uh, we have just gotten back to the trend. Now, this trend is 3.3% growth or something a little over 1% real, um, but maybe we don't want to believe in that. Here's a longer term trend. This is a 60-year trend line of uh, U.S. house prices and CPI inflation index to 1953 being 100. What you can see is the trend here is that house prices have a 0% real trend in growth. That is to say, they're, they don't go up in real terms. This is actually a believable theory if you think that, that uh, there's no reason for the cost of constructing houses or the cost of land to be more than inflation uh, in the long run, at least as long as there's additional land to use. Uh, on this measure, house prices fell after the bubble just back to the trend and have since rebounded to significantly over it. Indeed, this is a chart of the percentage deviation from the long-term inflation trend. We see the bubble there, but if you look to the far right, this is again a 60-year look. This is percent, which house prices on average in the U.S. differ from the trend of just CPI inflation. You can see that in 2013, by the end of the year, we we're back to the highest point we have had uh, over the inflation trend except, except for the bubble. Well, so are the bubbles back? Well, maybe. Um, um, what these... Um, what these house price uh, graphs tell me is either way you look at it, it's time for the Fed to stop trying to inflate house prices further and to stop buying mortgages. 
Now let me introduce our outstanding panel in the order in which they will speak. First we'll hear from Jay Brinkman, who is a mortgage finance consultant, formerly chief economist and senior vice president of research and education for the Mortgage Bankers Association, where he served from 2001 to 2014. Uh, before that, Jay was in portfolio strategy on the dark side at Fannie Mae and deputy chief of staff to the governor of Louisiana, and he has long provided thoughtful and informed commentary uh, to our conferences. Uh, next will be Mark Fogarty. Mark is editor-at-large of the National Mortgage News and Source Media's Mortgage Group, having covered the mortgage business since 1984. Mark directed the news team that won the George Polk Award for Financial Journalism, and his editorials have won the American Society of Business Editors Award. Uh, Mark says he is now on his fifth real estate cycle, so um, he may be able to explain to us why financial markets never grow smarter when it comes to real estate. Our third speaker will be Desmond Lockman, a resident fellow at AEI who was previously Managing Director and Chief Emerging Market Strategist at Solomon Smith Barney and Deputy Director for the IMS Policy Development Department. Desmond has written extensively, insightfully, and depressingly on the global economic crisis, the U.S. housing market, the U.S. dollar, and strains in the euro area, and today is going to focus on the international aspects of our topic. Uh, next will be Mark Carey, who's a senior advisor in the Division of International Finance at the Federal Reserve Board. Mark is also co-director of the National Bureau of Economic Research's Risks of Financial Institutions Working Group, and his recent work includes addressing systemic risk, the effects of the most recent financial crisis, and many technical papers on credit risk and corporate finance. Uh, we welcome Mark as a new member of our bubble series and look forward to his comments. Finally, uh, will be Chris Whalen, whose experience includes Bear Stearns, Prudential Securities, Tangent Capital, and Carrington Financial Services, and as co-founder and principal of Institutional Risk Analytics until 2013 when the firm was acquired. He's also the author of Inflated, How Money and Debt Built the American Dream. Uh, seven years ago, uh, Chris and I had the idea that AEI needed to address the effects of the bubble. That would have been spring 2007, uh, and it's apparent that we still do. Uh, each panelist will speak from 12 to 15 minutes. We'll give the panelists a chance to respond to each other or make clarifying points. And then we will open the floor to your questions. We will adjourn promptly uh, at 4 o'clock unless we run out of questions sooner. Uh, so do we have new bubbles? We're about to find out. Jay. Thank you, Alex. I also have to point out that we can adjourn early if we run out of answers uh, rather than just <laughs> questions. Um, so Alex uh, wanted to talk about uh, bubbles, and so I looked uh, long and hard, and I found a housing bubble a housing-related bubble out there. If you look at this run-up since the beginning of 2013 up to the present, uh, and what this bubble is is actually Fannie Mae's stock price uh, as to uh, what has gone up and, and trying to look behind what some of the reasons are, and I th if you, you bear with me, I think it's going to say something about what's taking place out there, that what was behind it, of course, the private equity funds coming into it, the day traders were taking advantage of some of the, the, the volatility, but if you look at what's really going on with Fannie, the prospects, both with the Senate bill, what's really there in terms of the capital, uh, it certainly raises a spinoff of the old question, uh, if you're so rich, why aren't you smart? So maybe they are smarter, perhaps, than it would appear on the surface. So essentially my topics this afternoon deal with some of the shareholder lawsuits that are out there demanding a, a portion of the reported earnings of Fannie and Freddie, and particularly some of the what, what Fannie has been doing and talking about their having, quote, paid back money to the federal government, uh, comments a little bit on the proposed Senate bill and why I think that is certainly laying the groundwork for some, some problems in terms of another bubble, and then a few comments on some of the latest housing data. So first on Fannie Mae, I, I've pretty much concluded that Fannie Mae is now the world's most expensive insurance agent. 
Uh, what do I mean by that? Well, in their ninth, uh, 2013 uh, progress report, uh, Tim Myopoulos said, uh, and this is on their website, so if you click onto their website, one of the first things that come up, uh, Fannie Mae's profits go back to the taxpayers. We will have paid a total of $121 billion in dividends to Treasury as of March 2014, which is approximately $5 billion more than we have received in taxpayer support. Um, Mr. Myopoulos, who I've met on uh, various occasions, is an attorney, so perhaps he could be excused in, in, in not picking up some of the errors of the public relations team at Fannie Mae that puts this together, but that the, the misleading nature of the statement is really at the crux of a lot of the shareholder claims, and in fact, as you hear people around town saying, Fannie Mae has paid back the money that was given to them by the federal government. Um, so that, you know, not only is it a question of whether or not the money has been paid back, but the very idea that the taxpayer support for this company was only $116 billion is simply incorrect. That if you look at what in fact Fannie Mae's balance sheet looks like as of the end of the year, about $3.2 trillion in assets, including uh, the, the credit exposure on their MBS, versus an equity base of about nine and a half billion dollars gives them a capital ratio of two point, uh, of, of 0.29 percent. So, you know, if you look at the implied and actual taxpayer support, okay, what Treasury was doing was putting enough money into Fannie Mae to keep the capital base from going negative. They were never saying we're going to recapitalize. They were only trying to say we're going to take it back to zero. Well, it's overshot a little bit through earnings and some other things that are there. But if you look at what is actually required to keep the company operating, and if you say it's sort of a normal, okay, let's pick a 5% leverage ratio, you can argue as to what would have been sufficient in terms of what would have been required for actual capital support <clears throat> to allow them to continue to uh, to sell the types of guarantees that were going into uh, uh, these earnings that have been reported, I come up with about another 164 billion, which means that the implied and actual support that the taxpayers who provided to Fannie really is more in the range of 280 billion dollars. Now, has that been paid back? No. What has happened is that the dividends, the earnings that have gone back have simply been a return on the equity, not a return of the equity. That if you look at on an average over the last five years, about $24 billion, that works out to about an 8.6 ROE. And I think any of the finance uh, specialists around town will tell you that's a pretty lousy ROE to expect on the kind of risk that you're getting out of here. Key point is that the recapitalization plans that have been shopped around this town, and I used to sit across the table from some of the different private equity uh, firms, the investors are saying, gee, the only way to do this is to take some of those earnings that Fannie's getting and, and divert them back away from Treasury and let Fannie retain those and the capital then will build up and then we can run the company for you because we're the, uh, uh, we've got the uh, subordinated, uh, uh, the preferred stockholders or, or even the subordinated debt. Well, uh, the answer is they were simply trying to say we're going to pay the government back uh, with the government's own money, or more specifically, let us keep some of the money going really back to the taxpayers, and we'll use that if, to pay the taxpayers back. I always ask myself, so that's a pretty slick trick. Do you really think everyone in Washington is that dumb that they would buy into this, but in fact, because we have seen some uh, comments in support of this very approach, they're not terribly off. And if you go through, I think, what is um, behind what they are doing, it is not so much a finance play as I think they have found a loophole in some of the legal documents, and I think it is really more of a legal play than a finance play that they're trying to do in terms of uh, keeping some of those dividends. So how dependent is Fannie Mae on the continued taxpayer support? If you look at their book of business, only 24% of their current book predates the conservatorship. Uh, 
76 percent is uh, is more recent since the conservatorship, since the federal government has put up the support for it. But if you look at the income, because the G fees are so much higher now than they were back uh, then, actually 84 percent of at least their G fee earnings are really dependent upon uh, this sort of post 2008 business. Again, with no claim from the people uh, uh, on that from their previous uh, shareholders. So. Um, why are they then the world's most expensive insurance agent rather than an insurance company? Uh, if you look at what the federal government does, the federal government's really putting up all of the capital, and I repeat that, all of the capital supporting the ongoing business, specifically the promise to make timely principal and interest payments to the security holders. They would not be able to sell a single mortgage-backed security without that kind of support given the capital levels they have. Through their regulator, they price that insurance. They're being told, okay, this is the G fee that you will charge on that. They're protected against competition. The regulator essentially is setting the credit standards, and they're using the power of the federal government to support counterparties, uh, disputes with counterparties, specifically, specifically the buybacks, indemnification. So they've got the full weight of the federal government to come in and help them negotiate deals with Wells Fargo, Chase, and others. What does Fannie Mae do with their 7,000 employees? Well, they market the insurance. They evaluate the counterparty risk. So if you think about it, the same claim that they're trying to make on the dividends would be the same as if your Allstate agent says, well, look, I sold that insurance. I think I should get the proceeds from that rather than the, um, uh, the company itself. So what can be done about this? Well, I think, first of all, take the necessary steps <clears throat> to sort of put an end to this fiction that there is, in any true economic or finance sense, earnings that are due back to the common shareholders. There has been opposition, certainly, to putting them into receivership. I've never quite understood that opposition, other than the fact that it would impact the debt ceiling limits. Fannie Mae was created in 1968 just because Lyndon Johnson did not want to go back to the Senate for a vote in increasing the, the debt ceiling, and that has been part of the problem now about bringing those assets and liabilities onto the books. The other issue is we could move immediately and start moving some of this risk and income away from the federal government, away from Fannie Mae, and away from contention in these lawsuits <clears throat> by putting forward a proposal of letting the private MI companies and the equity behind those companies uh, bear that risk have some of these earnings, and it would no longer be subject to, uh, to debate. <clears throat> okay, let me switch to uh, number two. I wanted to mention something about the, the Senate bill that's been kicking around that came out with some bipartisan support. Uh, there are two aspects of that bill that caused me considerable concern in terms of what it may mean in terms of impacting a bubble. First one is there is a 10% capital requirement on the um, <clears throat> securitizations that would come out of this. Uh, the second, there's a 10 basis point fee for the market access fund. To the extent you increase the cost of the securitization, increase what is demanded by having a much higher capital level than what's demanded in the rest of the industry, you're going to have just the higher risk loans concentrated in these securities. So if 10% is too high relative to other outlets, only the riskiest loans are then going to be attracted to that 10%. In terms of the market access fund, it doesn't make a lot of sense to me to demand a first-time home buyers a permanent 10 basis point fee, in a sense, on their loans to support something else. Various groups around town have called, about, called this a duty to serve on the part of uh, the, these financial institutions. I went back and found my personal duty to serve last time I saw it. For those of you who don't know what this is, this is my draft card from 1969, which was of no particular value to the U.S. military, but it certainly got me into any number of barrooms in Washington uh, back when the drinking age was 18. Um, I'm moving in the process of moving. I'll actually 
found a whole bunch of things I didn't know I still had. Third thing, let me talk a little about housing prices. A lot has been said about the Case-Shiller Index and the in, in indication of why this may be a bubble. I was sitting up here perhaps five, six, seven years ago with Charlie Calamaris, Mark Zandi, talking about um, home prices, and I went through a rather long discourse as to what I thought was wrong with the way Case Schiller was looking at uh, home prices. I said it has value, but it should not be taken as gospel. If you look at these lines, you will see that Case Schiller overestimates the peaks and overestimates the declines. If you look at the measures that came out of uh, OFEO and then FHFA with a much broader sample, a different methodology, you'll see a much more benign sort of pattern relative to what Kay Schiller uh, reports. So just keep that in mind as to what home price measure you're using when you're looking at different types of, uh, of home price changes. Uh, and Chris may want to talk about a little of that given his, uh, his, his new venture. Uh, finally, I just wanted to point out what's been going on in the current market. If you look at purchase applications according to uh, what comes out of uh, my old shop at the MBA, the research group with their weekly applications, if you look on, on a same month basis, how was this past January compared to the Januaries of years going back? Same thing for February. The March numbers haven't been reported back. There's nothing here to indicate that we're in the process of seeing a major rebound in terms of home purchases or, or driving up prices that way. So things are still sort of subdued. Uh, I congratulated my fellow chief economists around town when I left to say, gee, why didn't I have a really awful winter to blame everything on for the next three or four months? Uh, that They have that luxury. I don't know how much of this is really due to the weather, but really we are dragging behind uh, post-seasonal patterns. So with that, uh, Mark, it's all yours. Thank you, Jay. Mark Fogarty. Yeah, there we go. With such uh, distinguished and technically, technologically capable folks. Um, Alex was kind enough to point out that I've been covering uh, mortgages for the last 30 years. I was thinking recently in metaphorical terms, that would make me like a 30-year fixed rate mortgage, right? <laughs> so uh, the consequences of that are what I've come to is, well, I have matured, but I don't want to be reconveyed just yet. <laughs> anyway, uh, our, our task up here was to look for uh, real estate bubbles, and uh, I did, uh, I think I have found a, a frothy real estate market. Where's the... Okay, uh, it's not the national real estate market. Uh, Jay's uh, bo former boss, Dave Stevens, came up and uh, briefed us uh, a month or so uh, uh, ago and uh, said that uh, the national market values are about to within 9% of previous highs. So uh, is that uh, a bubble? What's wrong with that? Well, you know, they crashed from those highs, so I think we should keep an eye on that. But I don't think it's a bubble just yet. The one that I found is a niche market, but it's a pretty big niche with uh, $3 trillion in assets and $316 billion in debt outstanding. And it is the farm mortgage market. So the uh, farm mortgage market, I find, has grown 20% from 2010 to 2014. It has $187 billion in debt and is projected to grow again this year. Uh, for historical context, I went and looked up uh, and in 1990, it was, which of course was after the last big farm crash, but it was only a third as big, at about $66 billion. And uh, looking at the fundamentals, I think they're looking a, a little weak. Now, the farm mortgage uh, business is, a, I call it a funny animal. It's sort of a hybrid of residential and commercial. More, more of a commercial loan than a residential, but you know, you've got the uh, improvements, you've got the farm, you've got the, uh, the house, you've got the barn. Um, the cost of the land is generally far more than the cost of the improvements. And uh, it's also got a significant amount of non-mortgage debt because uh, the, you know, the farm mortgages also pay for a production loans. So about 40% of uh, total farm mortgage loans currently come from non-real estate loans. So it's a, a real, a true kind of a hybrid. So who uh, controls this market? 
about 50% are from a, uh, a little known cohort called Farm Credit System Lenders, and they are funded by the nation's oldest GSC, the Farm Credit Administration, which uh, dates back to 1916, 1917, something like that. About a third of the market is taken up by uh, commercial banks uh, through uh, local uh, farm banks. There are more than 2,000 of those as measured by ABA. A uh, considerable uh, number of life insurers have a, a good share of uh, ag mortgages. And also, I find fascinating, individuals make uh, farm mortgages. Uh, there's a little bit left over, Farmer Mac, which is a secondary market, the Farm Service Agency, which is a government kind of lender of last resort if you can't get a loan anywhere else. And again, sort of fascinating to me, storage facilities make farm mortgages, so go figure about that. So... I discovered that FCS lenders are certain areas are not well liked. And who is it that hates the FCS? It's commercial banks. And why is that? Because uh, agency cost of funds that they have give them an unfair advantage, according to the banks. Uh, FCA gets money currently at uh, 54 basis points over a 10-year treasury. And there is no uh, tax on profits from farm real estate lending for FCS lenders. So I was reminded of something my old boss told me years ago, and that was, if you have an unfair advantage, it's only fair to take advantage of it. So here's a couple of uh, lenders, uh, examples of ag mortgage lenders. Um, there's two in New Mexico, so I took them as sort of uh, typical. One's called Ag New Mexico, and it's based in Clovis, rural area. It's got $165 million in assets, and... Uh, you know, it looks like a pretty uh, uh, going concern as an institution, 17% capital, 2.9 million in net income for 2013. The other one is called Farm Credit of New Mexico, which is based in Albuquerque, although it has branches around the state. And that has, uh, it's a considerably bigger institution, has assets of $1.4 billion. 22% uh, capital, again, seems like a going concern, and uh, had $26 million in in income in uh, 2013. On the life insurer side, I took a look at MetLife, which uh, made $3 billion in ag mortgages in 2012, including, I'm fascinated to see, $300 million to farmers in Brazil. Their uh, total portfolio is at $13 billion, and they've been in the sector since 1917, or I guess as long as the farm credit uh, lenders have been. So let's take a look at farmland values. Uh, they were up 9.4% last year from 2012, 2,900 per acre, a 23% increase in the Northern Plains. Cropland values were up 13% in a year to 4,000 per acre. That's a 25% increase in the Northern Plains. Pasture land values up 4.3%, 1,200 per acre, and an 18% increase in the Northern Plains region. My conclusion is it's kind of a frothy market. So let's take a look at the froth by region. In the northeast, farmland, rose, farmland loans rose 30% in 2013. Of course, the northeast is not the biggest farming sector, but all the uh, areas of the country, all the regions of the country were up. In the south, farmland loans were up 5%. In the Corn Belt, 8%. In the west, 9% and in the plains, 10%. So that's pretty healthy growth. Unfortunately, there are some headwinds for farmers, and that is that the farm net cash income for 2014 is projected to be down 22%. That sounds like a pretty, uh, that's the USDA number. That sounds like a pretty big correction to me. And crop receipts may fall by 12%. Part of the, uh, you know, what's been buoying farmland values is that the uh, prices they get for the commodities grown on those lands have increased uh, rapidly over the last few years, partly due to weather reasons, but apparently uh, not projected to happen this year. And government farm payments uh, under the most recent farm bill are going to be reduced by 45 percent. I'm just guessing that AEI is in favor of that, but just a wild guess. Anyway, the growth of uh, farm mortgages, uh, USDA is projecting that it'll be growth mortgages will be down a third this year. It'll still be up, it'll be down less, 3.2 percent. But there's not a lot of people that are thinking there's something to be worried about here. So uh, our, uh, my colleague's uh, boss, uh, 
recently uh, said that she was uh, not concerned about uh, a bubble, although land prices, including farmland, are overvalued. The ABA said that farm banks are managing risk and have underwritten farm loans carefully. Again, quoting to my old boss, he always said, they pay me to worry. So I think there might be some uh, worrying in order. And my final takeaway here, as I imagine our uh, Brazilian farmers that are getting the loans from MetLife might uh, appreciate, frothy is fine for specialty coffee, but not for specialty finance. Thank you, Mark. Thank you. Desmond. Thank you, Alex. Uh, what I propose to talk about is how Federal Reserve policy of quantitative easing has impacted the emerging market economies and what might occur as the Fed continues its path of tapering. Now, when one looks at the emerging market economies, uh, one really doesn't want to look at them as a unified group, but I think one wants to make different distinctions between different groups of countries. So the first bunch of countries are the real troubled countries. You know, fortunately, systemically, they're not that important, but they can give rise to a lot of noise. I'm referring to Argentina, Thailand, Ukraine, Venezuela. All of these have got enormous economic imbalances and very bad politics, so we'll get a lot of noise out of that. The five countries that I think are systemically a lot more important and that are susceptible to moves in Federal Reserve policy are referred to in the markets right now as the Fragile Five. Uh, they include uh, Brazil, India, Indonesia, South Africa, and Turkey, and that's really where I want to focus most of my remarks. Uh, but before doing that, uh, I should point out that the largest of the emerging market economies that could be systemically very important uh, clearly has a bubble of its own making, and that is uh, the Chinese economy. You know, that what we've seen is in response to the 2008-2009 recession, the Chinese pumped up the economy. They've allowed credit to expand uh, exceptionally quickly, you know, particularly in the shadow banks. So you've got a situation right now in China where you've got credit as a percentage of GDP has gone up from something like 120% in 2008 uh, to 200% in uh, 2014. And most observers say that uh, you haven't seen a credit run-up like this without having a, uh, a, a bad ending. The only thing is in China, China is very different from other economies uh, that the state uh, has got plenty of international reserves. They've got the wherewithal to back up their banks. So while my expectation isn't that you're going to get a complete bust. Uh, it is that you'll get quite a slowing in China. Turning to uh, Fed Reserve policy, uh, I just put up this chart just to remind us, uh, firstly, that uh, the Federal Reserve quantum easing has been huge, increasing the balance sheet from something like 800 billion to over 3 trillion uh, in a short, relatively short space of time. Uh, but there are other players involved as well that I'm referring to what the Bank of Japan has been doing since at the end of 2012. Uh, it's increasing its balance sheet at a very much faster rate, something like 60 to $70 billion uh, a month. Uh, and you've also had uh, the Bank of England, and potentially one needs to watch what the ECB does you know, in response to uh, deflation. Now, during the upturn, what the Fed's policy did was beneficial to emerging markets in the sense that it, in the, to the extent that it averted a recession, it improved their export capabilities beyond what would otherwise have occurred. So it provides a boost to exports. It also provides a boost to uh, commodities. But the dangerous part of it is that it gave rise to huge uh, capital flows. Uh, this chart uh, that I'm putting up here is uh, from the World Bank. You know, basically what it shows is that the increase in capital flows to emerging markets, while not on the scale of what immediately preceded the 2008-2009 uh, 
bus uh, is pretty significant, that capital flows to these countries was amounting to something like 5% of the, their GDP. Uh, this led a country like Brazil to complain about the United States being engaged in a currency war. They weren't able to deal with those capital flows. So what occurs uh, is those capital flows, the countries that got most of the capital flows were the ones where you saw the yields being most compressed. Uh, you know, places like uh, Mexico, Poland, really got a huge amount of uh, inflows, got uh, uh, spread compression. But the disturbing part of all of this is that currencies appreciated by a lot, way above where they should have been. These countries didn't have the capability to deal with those capital inflows. They tried capital controls, they tried serialization, all the rest. That didn't prevent big appreciations of their uh, currencies. And then what you got is you got the opening up of current account deficits uh, in the balance of payments to levels that uh, are of concern. Uh, the ones that are most exposed are Turkey, South Africa, uh, Indonesia, uh, India, and Brazil. Uh, what you also got, uh, you know, which is related to a bubble of a different sort, is this gave rise, this easy money gave rise to very easy policies, both in terms of the budget, but more importantly in terms of monetary expansion. So this chart from the IMF shows that a number of these countries allowed credit to grow at very much faster rates than their GDP, places like Turkey, Brazil, Colombia, have got the double problem of having a credit bubble together with a very weak external position. So that means that as the Fed begins uh, unwinding its policy, uh, those countries could be in trouble. We got a foretaste of that with what occurred after Bernanke in May intimated that the Fed might start tapering May last year, that capital flows dropped to these countries by as much as 30%. Uh, their currencies uh, really took a dive uh, as money uh, left those countries so that we get uh, places like Turkey, South Africa, uh, Brazil, all having currency depreciations of something like 20%. And then you know, what is uh, unfortunate about all of this you know, in terms of their growth prospects is that these currency depreciations are occurring at the same time as their inflation rates are at relatively high levels, certainly in relation to what their inflation targets are. So these countries are raising interest rates, tightening monetary conditions. So what you've really got to expect is you've got to expect a substantial slowdown in growth of those countries, which could be of relevance because those countries uh, did provide a lot of the global growth. Uh, just let me say a word about uh, what the outlook is. Um, the outlook for the emerging markets is going to depend very much on what occurs in uh, the rest of the world. You know, China would be of particular importance to them. Uh, I think that uh, the Fed tapering is certainly going to be key. Uh, what the results of that are, the World Bank came out, you know, and I think that their analysis is correct, uh, basically saying uh, that depends very much how much long-term interest rates in the United States rise. If you get a modest rise in interest rates, the capital reversal will be relatively small. But if you get a, an increase in uh, long-term interest rates in the United States by a percentage point, uh, you could get a, uh, a substantial reversal of capital flows. If you had interest rates in the United States rise by two percentage points, uh, emerging markets could suffer from a sudden stop. Uh, my view is that the United States uh, long-term interest rates aren't going to back up uh, that much. Uh, so I don't, I'm not in the camp that these countries are going to be faced uh, uh, with a sudden stop. The other thing that I would say is that as the Federal Reserve is uh, tapering, uh, I, my view is that there's every prospect that you're going to get stepped up quantitative easing in other major countries. I'm thinking particularly of Bank of Japan. Uh, their economy is not doing particularly well. They've got a VAT increase in April. Uh, I could see the Bank of Japan uh, 
stepping up its quantitative easing, you know, that would be very beneficial from the point of view of global uh, liquidity, keep these emerging markets afloat. Uh, and likewise, uh, it seems to me that it's only a matter of time uh, before the ECB engages in unorthodox monetary policy, given the deflation uh, uh, threat there. Last two points uh, I'd make, uh, you know, the one is on the negative side, the other is on the positive side. Uh, the negative comment I'd make is that the Fragile Five, uh, they're having to deal with large imbalances in the economy at a very bad stage in their uh, political cycle. So Brazil, India, Turkey, uh, South Africa, uh, in India all face elections in the next few months, which complicates uh, dealing with their imbalances and makes it likely that you're going to get uh, a lot of noise from them. On the positive side, uh, I'd say that there's absolutely no question that when you look at the emerging markets today uh, as compared to where they were in 1998, uh, their fundamentals are incomparably better. They've generally got floating exchange rates, which means that you don't have the fixed exchange rate uh, kind of problem that was behind a lot of the 1998 crisis in Asia and Latin America. They've got very much better public finances, very much lower debt, and many of them have substantial arsenals of international reserves uh, to smooth out the currency. So in short, uh, I think that uh, uh, we've got problems in emerging markets, uh, but I think that uh, they should be manageable uh, from a global point of view. Thanks, Desmond. But before we take that slide away, uh, we ought to look at your third bullet point there, which is the main, oh, I'm sorry. You've, you're still on the electoral cycle. Sorry. Is your next slide in the packet there, the systemic impact? There we go. That third bullet point, which is the main channel you're saying is the financial market channel. It's the, it's the short-term capital flows that are really moving things around, I gather you mean. Correct. Uh, to be thought of. Okay, thanks, Desmond, very much. Mark Carey. So I'm also going to talk about farm real estate considerations without thinking about how robust will the system I'm proposing be in the face of bubble pressures. So this is the, the I, I do think, by the way, you know, I'm a Fed staff economist, so there's a usual disclaimer that it's only my own opinions. My version of that disclaimer is that comments by the staff are not newsworthy. So if there's anybody from the press here, then you know, quoting me is not going to get you any readers. Um, uh, you know, there was, in my opinion, there was a bubble in the farmland market, particularly in the heartland, the corn and wheat producing regions, uh, you know, 25 years ago. Sort of started inflating in the mid 70s, it peaked in the early 80s, it stopped popping in, uh, you know, the middle 1980s. Uh, and this chart, which is a little bit difficult to read, uh, is a scanned version of a chart that I made, you know, in the late 80s. Uh, and the top line, the line that looks like there's a big increase in the price of land, that's what's being plotted, and then it falls back again, that's the bubble. Uh, and this is prices on prime corn land in Illinois. And then the line below it, which kind of goes up for a while and then trends back down again, but does not really resemble the doubling of land prices in real terms and then dropping back again, uh, that's rents on that land. The nice thing about these data series is that you've got reasonable congruence between the measurement of the cash flow to the land. Land is just a factor of production. We're not talking about houses here or amusement parks. We're talking about something you use to grow crops. You've got congruence between the measure of the cash flow and the price uh, of the asset that's going to produce the cash flow. Now, the other thing that I'm not going to have time to show uh, is that for those who are skeptical that bubbles can ever exist, and there still are such people even today, uh, the usual 
rationale for the skepticism is, well, you can't just think about the cash flow. You have to think about the interest rate that you use to discount the cash flow. And so there isn't any bubble because the interest rates just changed or the risk premium, uh, and so everything's okay. Well, you know, one can tell a long story about that. You know, it was unreasonable on its face at the time, but the thing is the interest rate and the risk premium ought to be reasonably national in the United States, and the bubble was focused in the corn-growing land of the Midwest. If you've ever been to the Delaware or Maryland beaches, you drive through a lot of corn growing land in Delaware and you did not see anything like the price movements in Delaware that you saw in the Midwest. And so it seems unbelievable to me uh, that the you know, big price movement is due to a difference, a huge difference in the discount rate in the Midwest uh, than in Delaware. Okay. So that's part of the past. The next slide is a similar picture. This is national farm assets, proxy for land. Most of the assets are land. Uh, and returns, proxy for cash flow. It's the same sort of picture. Uh, but again, the dominant action was in the Midwest. Uh, and I see that I did not put in the deck the chart that I meant to put in the deck. Um, which I will describe to you. So if you look back at the bubble at that time, uh, it was a debt financed bubble. Uh, you saw a big increase in farm debt, uh, and one particular lender was responsible. The chart that I would put up would show the share of net new mortgage lending of the farm credit system, which Mark mentioned earlier, going to 100%. Okay, so Everybody else has got farm mortgages that they've made in the past, and so if you look at the stock of outstanding farm mortgage debt, the life insurers and the banks and the other marginal players all still had some. Their share was going down. But if you looked at who was making the loans on the purchases of land that was setting the price as the bubble approached its peak, it was essentially all the farm credit system. Okay, and now we come to the governance and institutional design problem with the farm credit system, which is that it was a cooperative. As Mark mentioned, it did not get its funding to make the mortgage loans by taking deposits like a bank. It issued securities in the U.S. agency market. And one can say that the whole problem was that there was an implicit federal guarantee on those securities, and therefore they were inattentive to risk. Yes, that might have been part of the problem, but one has to ask why you know, were they particularly inattentive to risk at this time when the bubble was happening and not through decades of previous history. The thing is, they were a cooperative of farmers who had mortgages with the farm credit system. Okay? And each cooperative was governed by a board of directors composed of elected or otherwise selected members of mortgage holding, the mortgage holding farmer community in their locality or region. Well, these are all people who are not selling their land. You know, they, they really believe there's a bubble, they're going to sell. They can still be farmers because they can just rent the land back for production. You don't live on the land. You just plow the land and you plant seed and you harvest crops. So the problem from a bubble financing standpoint of the farm credit system then was that it was pretty good at telling the good farmer from the bad farmer because it was run by farmers, but it was really bad at knowing whether prices were in bubble territory or not, and therefore really bad at changing the terms of the mortgage loan. Because if you're going to make mortgage loans in a bubble, the first thing you should do is you should reduce your loan to value ratio so that you've still got collateral left after the price crashes, and they did not do that. Coming to the present day, here's a chart of crop land values. Uh, and 
We can see the bubble there in the late 70s and early 80s, and we can see the crash. And we can see the cropland values now coming up even higher. Uh, in 2013 dollars, this is another constant inflation-adjusted chart, even higher than it was in the previous bubble. And we can see a couple of little dots out there with some writing next to them. And that's sort of very recent price observations. So the line's shooting up, but now all of a sudden it flattens out. Why is that? Well, maybe it's because farm income, as was stated, has gone down. Um, here is uh, a ratio of land prices to rent. And again, you see this ratio shooting way up, even higher, much higher uh, than it was back in the uh, 70s and early 80s. And then finally, we've got a picture of farm debt. Uh, and the top, I don't, I'm, I'm, a, I'm a guy, so I'm not good at color words. You know, I've only got red, blue, green, yellow. Uh, but the, the top slice in this pie, the sort of bluey, greeny slice, this is the farm credit system. And although it's not in the, you know, percentage of net new mortgage loans, because this is the stock of debt, you can see that their slice is increasing. Everybody else's slice is sort of, as a percentage of the total, getting smaller. So we got the same situation that we had before, which is that the farm credit system at the margin is financing this bubble. Their structural makeup was, has changed in the little details. You know, a lot of the cooperatives consolidated with each other, some of the regional cooperatives consolidated, uh, but fundamentally it's still a cooperative organization. And so they did not learn the organizational lesson of the last bubble, uh, and therefore they have the same proclivity to finance this one. In the last chart, you know, this is a chart of debt capacity. I mean, I just put this deck together yesterday in <coughs> 10 minutes, uh, so I didn't go off and try and decide whether this chart is right. Uh, but, you know, it seems to show that things are okay right now. It seems to show that although farm mortgages are being made, they must be much safer on average because the debt load relative to debt repayment capacity is not going up. But this is a chart which is based in the, sort of the current observation on the estimate of the farmer's debt capacity. Okay, now, crop prices have been pretty high for the last five years or so, just as they were pretty high in the mid to late 1970s. And so the fact that the debt load relative to payment capacity isn't going up might be because there's not too much debt. That would be good. Or it might be because there's too much optimism about what's the repayment capacity, and that would be not so good. So I don't know where I am on time. I didn't look at the clock. OK. So again, you know, bubbles are a perennially interesting subject. It's a subject of great controversy among my university friends who continue to like to debate whether they can exist at all. Uh, but if one wants to actually do something about it, uh, my submission is a place to start that's likely to be somewhat constructive is institutional design, particularly of the lending entities or the guaranteeing entities, to try and increase the chance that they pay attention to whether there's a bubble going on and change their behavior. That would certainly contribute to financial stability. I'm leaving aside the issue of what do you try to do to actively push against the bubble. There's a number of nations around the world since the crisis that have done things like loan to value ratio limits or debt to income limits. The jury's out on how effective that's been. It's politically difficult. It's operationally very difficult. Thank you for your attention. Thanks very much, uh, Mark. A specifically really interesting case of real estate prices and lending in itself, but with, uh, as you suggest, broad implications for the bigger topic. Chris. Uh, thank you, Alex, and thank you again for seven years of uh, interesting panels, which uh, we're celebrating today. 
Uh, like Mark, I managed to uh, omit a couple slides from my deck. This is actually a version of this presentation that I gave at the Banque de France on March 11th. That's your hint. The uh, date is wrong. But I'll make sure that it's updated after, uh, after we're done. Um, let me start off first and just talk a little bit about really some of the points Jay made, which is home prices and, and what's happened over the past couple of years. Uh, for those of you who follow uh, the home price market, uh, we've seen uh, double-digit increases in home prices nationally as measured by the Case-Shiller Index. Obviously, the economy is not growing 12 percent a year, is it? Uh, so when you see the disparity between economic growth and the change in price of a fundamental asset like homes, you know that eventually the home price market is going to slow down and it's going to start to approximate what's going. You averages at the zip code or metropolitan area level actually shows you homes, 44 million uh, discrete home observations nationally. And if you look at that data set, you can tell very clearly that home prices have uh, plateaued, the herd has slowed down, the, the superior homes are still going up in price. Uh, five of the top ten markets in the U.S., of course, are in California. But what we call the canaries, which are the least desirable homes in each cohort, are starting to fall. Uh, home prices turned very slowly. It's a very large mass market with lots of different data elements, and it takes weeks, months, sometimes years for changes in perception and changes in investor behavior uh, to affect the direction of home prices. So we may still see the Case-Shuler Index continue to go up for a good bit of this year, but I would not be surprised if by the end of the year it's starting to fall in absolute terms on a, on a national basis. Uh, why have home prices improved so much? Well, really two factors. Uh, first was what we call the REO trade, which were banks selling properties that they had taken in foreclosure, which were at a deep discount compared to a similar house. You, you had a huge price disparity between a bank-owned property and a voluntary sale, and so obviously the pricing was also skewed by this, because if you had two homes very similar in the same neighborhood and one was sold for 60 percent of the price of the other, then obviously home prices would fall. And, and Jay made this point earlier when we got together before the event that Case Shiller tends to overshoot on the upside and it tends to under, uh, overshoot on the downside as well. It exaggerates uh, the price movements. Um, the other reason why we've seen the brisk improvement in home prices is a shortage of supply. Somewhere between 20 and 30 percent of all homes in the U.S. are still underwater, which means that the seller cannot go to a closing without writing a check. And, you know, for many of us, if you have to write a check when you sell your house, you're not going to sell it. And so there are a lot of areas in the U.S., especially uh, states like Nevada, for example, where a third of all homes are still underwater where you have tight supply, especially in those desirable areas near the city centers, which have seen the best improvement in home prices. On the peripheries, as you go further out from the city centers, you haven't seen the same degree of, uh, of home price improvement. And then, of course, we have the, the twin evils of Dodd-Frank and Basel III, which are discouraging banks from making loans. Um, I think this is a big factor, but it's not the only factor. The other thing that's affecting the market a lot is simply that the job market's soft, consumer income is relatively flat, and jobs and income are the real drivers for the housing market. If you don't have people who are employed, if they don't feel confident, they don't have the income that they need to meet the regulatory tests that we have today to get a mortgage, then they're not going to apply. And as you can tell by looking at the Mortgage Bankers Index, applications are, are doing very poorly. March is when you like to see applications up. Because people come in and apply for a mortgage in March and April, so they can go out and buy a house after their kids are done with school. So, you know, my sense is that the home price market appreciation we've seen for the last couple of years is, is going to very definitely slow down this year. Now, you know, here's a similar chart that you saw before. The red line is the CoreLogic index. Um, obviously, we've come back nicely, but you can also see that, uh, that trend line, that polynomial trend line. Uh, it's only up slightly. In other words, yeah, we've recovered a bit, but if you look at the swing between the peaks in 05, 06, and where we ended up in 2008, 2009, you could characterize this latest uptick as, again, kind of a reaction. Why do I say that? Well, first and foremost, 40 percent of the home purchases are for cash. These are not first-time home buyers. These are not families. These are investors. Why are they doing this? Well, the Fed. 
The Fed wants to see asset price inflation, and they've got it. You've got institutional investors out buying one to four family homes and uh, selling bonds based on these assets and going into the property management business as an institutional activity. I would suggest to you that this is not rational behavior, but because interest rates are low and there's a lot of money on Wall Street and a lot of people want to earn management fees, they've decided to go and do this. Uh, managing properties is a tough business. It's usually a local business, a mom and pop kind of business uh, that doesn't have leverage and doesn't have uh, you know, big management fees associated with it, but that's what we have today. Um, the other thing is, remember, volumes are low, so the prices that we have seen, the observed prices that go into an index like this, are a function of extremely low volumes in many uh, parts of the country. Now, this is a picture. The blue line is the portfolio of one to four family loans held by all U.S. banks. It's a little under $2.5 trillion. Uh, the total housing market in the U.S. is about $10 trillion. So what this tells you is that U.S. banks really only have ever supported about a fifth of the market with their own balance sheets. All the rest of it is in mortgage-backed securities. Uh, virtually all of it is guaranteed by the U.S. government. A lot of our colleagues here at AEI like to talk about getting the private sector back into housing. But the truth of the matter is, is the private sector has never really supported housing in a meaningful way. They came in during the boom because they saw an opportunity. But really, historically, if you go back to World War II and the Great Depression, uh, the government has been the major factor in this asset class simply because it's so big. You know, $10 trillion is a very, very big asset class. And the market for mortgage securities in the United States is one of the biggest markets in the world after the U.S. Treasury market. So my sense is that this decline that you've seen in the portfolio holdings of banks because they're not making many loans and because they don't have a lot of consumers coming to them looking for mortgage loans is going to continue to decline. I wouldn't be surprised if uh, this data series goes back to where it was in 2000 or before, which could be you know, well below $2 trillion. That's not good for the housing market, but it, you know what it is what it is. There's a supply piece and a demand piece in this marketplace, and until we get job growth, consumer income to start growing a bit, I don't know how we fix this, even if we were to fix the regulatory uh, matrix that we have today, which is, is very, very tough. The other thing, of course, to keep in mind is that the decline you're seeing in the portfolio holdings of banks is also mirrored in the loans that they're selling into the agency market today. Volumes are dropping. We had about $600 billion in agency sales last quarter. I would not be surprised to see that number well below 500 by the end of this year. And again, it's simply a matter that they just are not putting on enough loans, both to keep their portfolio stable and to sell loans into the agency market that investors can buy. You know, where are banks growing? Commercial lending a little bit. Uh, credit cards, auto loans, these are all asset classes that are growing right now. But the shrinkage in the mortgage market, I think, goes to the point of our, our conference today, which is that we still have the bubble. The bubble is shrinking in a sense that, you know, the credit is slowly declining that was applicable to the housing market. And we're also seeing other aspects of it declining slowly. This is a very gradual process because these are big numbers and it takes a long time uh, for the changes to, uh, to occur. If you look at the operations side of banks right now, they're taking people and resources out of mortgage lending uh, by big chunks. All of the major banks have been laying off front office people, uh, laying off back office people, and the banks are also trying to transfer a lot of loans off their balance sheet to non-bank servicers, to, to literally to get out of the business. I always like to remind people that in 1991, Wells Fargo actually got out of residential lending entirely. People find that astounding, given that they're the market leader today. But, you know, it was a, not a particularly attractive business in the early 1990s, and they just decided it wasn't of sufficient scale to continue to invest in it, so they got out. Now, this is, I think, a very interesting chart. It shows you the non-performing loans on the books of U.S. banks. Um, the blue line is 30 to 90, uh, 89 days. This is the most recent non-performing loans, and obviously you can see it's gone down quite a lot. It's, it's been cut in half since 2007 when it peaked at about $80 billion. This is why the banks have been able to say, well, things are better. But as you'll notice, the 90-day plus and the non-accrual items are just kind of sitting there. They've come down a little bit, but look at how elevated this whole group of three data series are compared to the way it was before the crisis. Before the crisis, home prices were going up constantly. 
you had other factors that made the situation look particularly good. But obviously, you can now see that from 1990 on forward, when you had a secular increase in home prices, we were not really seeing the cost, the credit cost, if you will, of default. Now you see it. There's another $100 billion kicking around in the system that hasn't been labeled non-performing yet. And you probably have about that much inside HUD and the other agencies that they still have not dealt with. So if you think of that earlier chart, the total portfolio of US banks is about $2.5 trillion. About 10% of it's distressed. And, and it's going to take time to work it out. Most of these loans are in the Northeast. They're in states that have tough consumer protection laws or judicial states for foreclosure. It takes years to work out a loan, two, three, sometimes four years between default when a bank actually gets a hold of the loan. So that's why these numbers are lingering at these levels. And as I say, I don't expect them to come down uh, that quickly. In fact, they could loiter there for a while. Um, in terms of what I expect for the future, you know, if we think of the bubble as enduring and as the banks having to take uh, longer and longer to work through it, uh, what's next? Well, I think the, uh, you know, the blind spot a lot of us have are second liens. If we go back to this chart just quickly, these are all first lien loans that are distressed. Where did you have your second mortgages? They're in the Northeast in California. California has kind of fixed itself because it's such a desirable place to live. Prices have come back very well in the nice parts of California, not in the desert, not in the Inland Empire. For these areas and also for a lot of the Northeast, Connecticut, New Jersey, Massachusetts, New York, these are the worst areas for both foreclosure and also in terms of home volumes, more, you know, home sales. Uh, if you're in the non-performing loan market today, the bottom bid is for a house in New Jersey because it takes three, sometimes four years to work out that loan and the pricing reflects that. Well, when those first lien loans are eventually worked out, what is the second lien going to be worth? Zero. You know, this half of home prices are really not going to continue to go up the way they have for the past couple of years. We're going to have to start seeing write downs of these loans. And I think it's very interesting that we just got done with the Fed stress tests and the Fed somehow or another didn't even touch on this because for me, if I'm thinking about large institutions, uh, second lien loans is probably the most pressing issue in terms of credit risk. And yet it's also an issue obviously that nobody wants to talk about. Because if you start talking about how home prices are done going up, then by the time you get to year end 2014 and you're the CFO of a big bank and you've got to sign off on your financial statement, obviously you and your auditor are going to have a meaningful conversation about just what are these second lien loans worth. And I, I, I expect that to be a, a topic of concern for a lot of our, our colleagues in the regulatory community this year. That's what I've got. Thanks, Chris, very much. Um, you mentioned, you mentioned uh, auto loans. Um, one of the surprises of the uh, bust was uh, that people paid their car loans before their mortgages, in many cases at least, because we always used to say you always pay your mortgage first which uh, gave car loans a better uh, record. Uh, but it also is, seems to be the case now that the subprime auto loan is, uh, market is booming again after it collapsed in the 1990s. Uh, not a huge market, but nonetheless uh, a significant one, I think. Well, we had some great presentations. I want to give each speaker a chance to either respond to what anybody else said or, or add something or clarify something. We'll just uh, go down the table here. Jay, anything else? Well, I just wanted to echo a point that, that Chris made that I think is really important about the bank appetite for mortgages going forward. Uh, we've seen a pullback uh, in a number of areas, uh, banks uh, disgorging their, their mortgage servicing, saying we will only hold on to servicing in footprint. To the extent now the mortgage is linked to other products within that bank, that the, that the banks are not necessarily interested in, in mortgages to a completely one-off customer. Uh, Wells had gotten out. PNC got out of the business as recently as 2000 or 2001, got back into it when they bought Nat City, and it wasn't entirely clear to me that they realized Nat City had a big mortgage operation when they bought it, and they <laughs> decided not to keep it going and decided to, to keep it so they were looking at maybe getting out of the mortgage business twice in one decade. So I think it's going to be a real question going forward as to what 
are the regulatory and reputational penalties of staying in the mortgage business. Is it really worth it, particularly for someone that you don't have a customer relationship with otherwise? And, and my expectation is we're going to see a continued downward trend. Thanks, Jay. Uh, Mark? Uh, yes, a couple of uh, points. Uh, Mark was talking about the, uh, the farm bubble, the GSE share uh, increasing and, uh, and kind of bidding up the uh, prices. And it just occurred to me that, you know, the real estate collapse of uh, 07, uh, the, the GSEs were certainly involved, but they had partners in crime with the, uh, the asset-backed lenders. And then something Chris said uh, is very true that Wells, uh, you know, they're the biggest mortgage lender. And uh, back in the 90s, they totally got out of mortgages except for, uh, you know, if they had wealthy uh, clients, they would do uh, mortgages for them. Actually, they wouldn't do them themselves. They would actually arrange a mortgage for them uh, with uh, some other institution. But what happened there was that uh, Wells was uh, acquired by Norwest, which was the biggest mortgage lender in the country at that time. And uh, Norwest was the acquiring company, but they took the Wells name. And so that's how they got that little, uh, you know, two-step tango in and out uh, back in the early 1990s. Desmond? Yeah. I guess I've got one question and uh, two comments. Uh, you know, the question I've got is, should we really be worried about a bubble in farm prices in the same way as we would worry in about a bubble in the housing market, you know, prior to 2008, 2009, I wouldn't have thought that farm uh, prices were that relevant and that the interconnections were such that we really needed uh, to worry too much. But that's uh, the question uh, that I've got. I generally don't uh, have the answer to it. Uh, the two comments I'd make, um, I've got to say, I somewhat depressed about the discussion. You know, the one is uh, a comment that because markets are very large, uh, governments have to be involved. I find that a very depressing uh, view. I'm not sure that I agree that that is necessarily the case. You know, I thought that government involvement uh, with the housing market really got us into the mess that we did. You know, uh, it would be very depressing if we can't move uh, away from that. Uh, the second uh, depressing thought that I've got uh, is just in relation to the bubbles, you know, that we've got these central banks blowing bubbles. We didn't really talk much about, you know, maybe there's a bubble in the U.S. Treasury market, maybe there's a bubble in all of these. Uh, you know, I'm just amazed at how credit spreads just keep narrowing, irrespective of what's going on. Russian march into Ukraine and credit spreads, so, you know, just it's kind of like a one-day event. You know, I would have thought that uh, uh, that is uh, of some concern. You know, and going forward, we just seem to be blowing bigger bubbles. Uh, you know, and I thought that our experience is that we have some kind of consequence. You know, and I'm just depressed that uh, there's nothing much that we can do about it. Thanks, Desmond. Mark. So, I mean, my instinct is on the sort of farm real estate situation, to agree that it doesn't seem like it's systemic. But, you know, that's one of the challenges of bubbleology and bubble management. Where do you draw the line, you know, when something is big enough to be systemic? I remember in 2006 and 7, you know, people were saying, well, there's a bubble in the housing market. And one of the, to my ears, persuasive you know, comebacks to what should we do about it answer, you know, not a lot, was, yes, the subprime stuff is crazy, uh, but it's a relatively small part of the total market, you know, and everything else is prime. There wasn't a lot of talk about Alt-A, which turned out to be a disaster, not of the magnitude of subprime, but still significant. And there were a lot of sort of knock-on and interconnection effects. So I don't have any reason to believe that a, you know, fall in corn values in Iowa from $6,000 an acre to $3,000 an acre is going to bring down the global financial system. Uh, but, you know, I think that there's a kind of larger issue here of, you know, what markets are big enough to care about. On the issue of banks, you know, getting out of the mortgage business, I mean, I'm not a residential real estate expert, and so I defer to my betters here. 
But when I hear bankers talk about the mortgage business and their business strategy, it's a little bit more nuanced. I don't hear the big banks saying, we're going to get out of making mortgages. I hear them saying, you know, that's been on the whole a profitable business for us in terms of new business done in the last few years. A lot of our sort of legal liability troubles are left over from before. I hear them saying there are certain kinds of clients, subprime clients or kinds of mortgages, non-qualifying, non-conforming, non-something or other, I don't know the terminology that they are reluctant to do right now. Uh, and in my mailbox, I still get at least one letter a week from some bank somewhere saying, don't you want to refinance your mortgage? Uh, what I don't get is you know, one letter a day from some small non-bank mortgage finance company, which I used to get pre-crisis, saying, don't you want to refinance your mortgage? And you know, so this change in the structure of the system appears to make credit less available. Uh, but isn't that somewhat of a good thing? Wasn't there too easy mortgage credit pre-crisis? Weren't there a lot of people who were getting credit who couldn't pay it back? And doesn't there need to be sort of a change in the structure of the business? I'm not saying the way it is right now is the right way, uh, but you know, the, the notion that we should go back to 2005, I think, is it just doesn't sound right to me. Thanks. Let me just stick a comment in there before we give Chris a chance, and that is the point you make about subprime uh, comments back in 2006. I remember very well, as this market was imploding and all of the specialized lenders in it were going bankrupt. Uh, that was a common, very common argument. Well, this is a relatively small thing. It'll be too bad for them. And that left out pr primarily the, the issue of asset prices, the asset in this case being houses, and that the interaction of credit uh, and price had driven these, these prices to levels which could not be validated by future incomes. And that, I think, is what's so nice about thinking about this farmland situation as well. It looks like we may have the, the same thing. And you can't really say how big it is unless you figure out this, this interaction between the expansion of money, the expansion of credit, and asset prices. And as I said in my introductory remarks, uh, asset price inflations make a lot of people very happy uh, until it makes a lot of people very sad. Uh, Chris. Well, let me give Desmond reason for hope. See, what one of the interesting things, I've, I grew up in Washington, I work for Jack Kemp, and you know, I sit here in American Enterprise Institute, and it's like being home. Uh, but the narrative in Washington is government versus private sector. And what we have forgotten is that 100 years ago in this country, the big problem was monopolies, private monopolies. But since World War II, since even World War I, they have mutated into a public-private partnership. And so what we really had that drove the bubble was a monopoly between government-sponsored entities and the biggest banks. In the 80s and the 90s, you had home builders and non-banks who could issue their own CMOs, finance their own operations without banks, and indeed compete with the commercial banks on equal terms. In uh, 1992, the SEC passed Rule 3A7, which essentially enabled the non-banks to drive the U.S. economy. This is why Bill Clinton is always given credit for the Goldilocks economy. It was because you had a broad private sector financial market apart from the banks, which had been government appendages going back to World War II. Unfortunately, you had things like Kidder Peabody, Askin, even Bank One, who all got into trouble during that period. And in 1998, the SEC under Arthur Levitt passed the amendments to Rule 2A7, which handed the big banks and the GSEs a monopoly on the U.S. mortgage sector. Ten years later, we had the crash. Now, I think that it's important for us to understand that if we want to fix the market, if we want to fix the GSEs, as we talked about earlier, we have to go back and look at the real details of why it is a non-bank financial company can't sell their own commercial paper to a money market fund today. It's because of that SEC rule that was passed in 1998. That was a mistake because look what happened. Citigroup said, well, I can go out and create all these structured investment vehicles. 
uh, and sell the paper to money market funds. That was the essence of the crisis. So I think, you know, we have to stop thinking of government versus private sector here because it was a public-private partnership that caused the subprime bust and indeed monopolized all of the prime mortgage paper. If you think about Lehman Brothers, Bear Stearns, all of the non-bank issuers, what were they doing? They were feeding on the periphery of the market that where the government and the big banks had already taken all of the prime collateral. I'll never forget, I worked for Bear Stearns twice. When I heard they had opened a retail mortgage desk and they were actually making loans, I knew that we were doomed. I knew that there was something basically wrong here. But, you know, it, it, it says our dear friend Bob Feinberg, who's not here today, he always has taught me, which is that a, a private sector entity cannot compete with a GSC. And if you look at the mortgage market today, the commercial banks monopolize the short-term market for funding. So Aquin, NationStar, Walter, they all have to fund off the big banks. That's where they get their warehouse funding to close mortgages. And then the GSEs issue the bonds, and they ha obviously have the best execution out there. No private sector entity can compete with Fannie Mae, Freddie Mac, or Ginnie Mae. So to me, that's, that's an important point. Perfect place uh, to end. Uh, uh, some very interesting comments and to open the floor for your questions, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, may I remind you, uh, we ask that you wait for the microphone so you're on the record for posterity. We'll get you first. And uh, tell us your name and your affiliation and uh, ask your brief and uh, cogent question right here, please. Jesse Wire, FHFA. Hey, and uh, actually, Alex, I want to pick on you for a little bit. Uh, uh, there is, I think, a problem when we're thinking about bubbles with presenting charts where we have one index overlaid upon another index, and then we show how one index moves relative to that other index, and then try to draw some conclusions. So you've got uh, the, the house, nominal house price index and the consumer price index, but where you've got it and your source is MGIC is at 100 equals 1953, the first quarter. There's an implicit assumption there which says that house prices were an appropriate relation to consumer prices in 1953. Now, if you are sitting in 1953 and you're watching the baby boom happen, and then you see women into the workforce, and then you see single women buying houses, you probably would say, I expect house prices to appreciate faster than other prices, given what we're, what we're seeing. And people do this with other things, price to rent ratios, where you set it equal to 100 in some period, and then you say, look, prices are, but, but you're assuming. So, and, and I know that you didn't say that there was a bubble. I would just say that we need to caution ourselves when we show these. I'm going to uh, cut you there. This is a, a good point with all trends. The starting point is obviously an issue, and we should all agree that all charts should be treated skeptically. Uh, nonetheless, they have something to tell us, perhaps. Um, fair point. Other questions? Bob, back here. Uh, Bob Long, chairman of Westbourne and the Rebasset Management. A uh, question to you, Chris. Uh, you point out that equity loans are still out there, and loans underwater are a major problem. Could, could you address that in terms of the test just given to banks and uh, the implications of what they did not consider and your view of those tests and their validity? Well, I, I think, you know, as an industry, uh, and this goes back to the 30s, the banks have been trying to deal with problems sequentially, deal with the most pressing problem first, and use to the extent they can income to deal with it. Um, I remember uh, when I was uh, running our bank rating business and uh, BPT took a year and a half more than everybody else to deal with their problem loans. I thought there was something wrong, but no, they just had the money and they took their time. So I think what happened here is that the, the large banks own the second lien mortgages, by and large, they're in portfolio. And they have been paying, even though they're underwater. The default rate on second liens has been relatively low. But now that many of these home equity loans are now amortizing where the borrower is no longer just paying interest, but they're paying interest and principal, and they're being forced to pay them down. 
I think you're going to start to see much higher default rates. You know, what's interesting is that if you look at the first lien mortgages in the U.S., the default rate today is a little less than half of 1 percent, but more than 6.5 percent of them are late, which means that somebody at the servicer has to call the debtor and remind them to pay their mortgage. Uh, that's not like a subprime portfolio, which can be 12 or 15 percent. But still, that's of concern because if home prices stop going up and you think of that 15 million population that's underwater and they're currently paying their mortgages. But eventually, if that home price appreciation doesn't get them back above water, they will default. They'll walk away, they'll need to go for a new job, whatever it is. So I think that, you know, second liens are next. And it was significant to me that the Fed and the other regulators have not addressed this head on because, you know, the banks have the income to deal with it now. But I can understand why they don't want to talk about it because, you know, a write down of tens of billions of dollars, let's say we did a 50% haircut on second liens to get them marked to market, um, that would be a significant chunk of change for the industry and especially for some of the larger banks. Look at JP Morgan, they've been writing them off themselves. They're writing off performing loans right now. Uh, and I think that kind of approach is probably very prudent. So I hope that answers your question. Thanks, Jay. More comments on second liens? Uh, just very quickly, I think it's important when you look at the numbers on the second liens is to distinguish between the relatively new ones versus those sort of legacy second liens. Because one of the things we will see with coming out of a mortgage environment of 3.5% mortgages, 4% mortgages, is people are going to be very less likely than if there's any kind of equity buildup uh, to do a cash out, particularly if they're already well below an ADL TV, they're instead going to turn to a second lien mortgage because they're going to be much less likely than to give up that 3.5% first. So I think we're going to see a growth, but I think we're going to see a growth of very well-performing seconds. I, that will very much contrast with some of the ones Chris was talking about. Anything on seconds? Nothing on seconds, but if I uh, could... Uh, Chris mentioning Jack Kemp uh, triggered a memory for me, and that's when uh, at an MBA convention, actually, uh, Mr. Kemp walked into the press room. So I went up to him and I said, you know, oh, Mr. Secretary, how are you doing? He says, well, you know, a funny thing just happened to me outside. A guy came up to me and he said, you know, you look a lot like Jack Kemp. And Kemp said to the guy, yeah, I get that a lot. And the guy said, too bad. <laughs> uh, other questions? Uh, We'll get you in just a second. I do want to add a comment to what Chris talked about, the old loans then being written off slowly as you find, as the banks find a new source of income. If we go back to the mid-1970s, the banking system was close to broke in this country from bad commercial real estate loans made off balance sheet through real estate investment trusts. Well, they didn't write down the loans. What they did was not recognize the losses and then slowly correct them because they found a new source of very profitable business. This business was loans to other countries, to what we then called less developed countries, and that had a tremendous growth rate, made a lot of money. They were able to get out of the old bad real estate loans. Then in 1982, all of the less developed country loans defaulted, uh, and at the instruction of the Federal Reserve, the banks did not, were not allowed to write down their loans, and they held on to them. But they were able to take the losses slowly over time because they found a new source of great profitable business, which was commercial real estate lending, which had a tremendous boom in the 80s and then a tremendous bust in 1990. Uh, 91. So you could write off the old mistake in international loans with all the money you were making on commercial real estate loans. Well, then those went broke, and you had to write them off, and we found a new source of profits, which was residential mortgages. <laughs> so there is an interesting cyclical uh, phenomenon here with the banking system. Yes, sir. Uh, Thomas Hoyer, there was a very interesting discussion last week here at AEI looking at the Fed and the Treasury. And I was asking, uh, it brings up... Thank you. That was my panel, too. Appreciate that. Yeah, so, uh, you know, I bring up the issue. How much is the issues re repeating themselves like you're talking about, especially when you get involved with politics and let, instead of letting the markets take care of it, you're letting the politics take care of it. But going further, when you look at contagion that's happened around the world, it happens, the markets flow through, and then they repeat themselves over again. But I'm looking at, from the perspective right now, 
if the Fed and the Treasury are tight together versus independent, and it globally as well with the others and the uh, um, central banks, do we have an issue when you see, like right now, the last time you guys had a meeting here, we were talking about the Fed taking on, I think it was 65 to 1 ratio debt are, um, on their balance sheet. Is that getting worse? And are they just covering for the GSEs so they can look better to pay the Treasury? And you ask that same question with GM. Did they not disclose the problems because they had the inside information so they could pay it off for the Treasury? Okay, thanks. Very good question. How, what do we think, uh, panelists, about this interaction between uh, the government uh, financing things and all of the issues we've been talking about? And in particular, how does the fact that the Fed is the biggest investor that there is today in mortgages play onto the, uh, into the housing market? Chris? Well, you know, it's funny. A lot of conservatives get upset about this, and they say, well, the Fed is printing money. No, they're not. They're investing bank reserves, and they're earning a grotesque spread between the securities and the <laughs> quarter point they pay the banks, and then they're remitting this to the Treasury, which is rather aggressive if you think about it. If, if anything, they should leave some of that. And one of the things I worry about, going back to the question about stress tests, is that the kids on trading desks today, they put the numbers into their Bloomberg terminal to come up with their hedge ratios, and they don't understand that the Fed has been taking trillions of dollars worth of duration out of the market, which is not represented in the numbers. So when securities do move, as they did last summer after Chairman Bernanke's press conference, you know, we had a two to one, two and a half to one ratio move between the agency market and the 10-year Treasury bond. And a lot of firms took very serious losses, so serious that many of them, like NationStar, for example, are getting out of mortgage lending entirely. Uh, the guys at PennyMac, for example, missed their hedge ratio by 1,600 basis points. Cost them a billion dollars. So, you know, I, I think that this whole issue you raise, it's not so much that the Fed is losing money. That's good. If the Fed loses money on their portfolio as a result of rates rising, that, that's a sign of success. I actually wrote a column about this just for House, House Republicans. Uh, but on the other hand, the financial institutions in this heavily manipulated market could get swamped. I'll never forget when I was at the Fed in the 80s during the G, uh, uh, the Plaza Accord process, Jerry Corrigan used to come to the trading room and ask us if we had killed anybody that day. And he was worried about small you know, futures trading firms, small banks, small broker-dealers who had been run over by the central bank intervention, and luckily it didn't happen. But I, I, that's a concern I have. Thanks, Chris. Other comments on how the Fed plays into uh, any of these issues? And, of course, Desmond hit the international part of this and the, uh, and, and the emerging markets being uh, definitely affected. I'm just not sure that I can agree with the idea, you know, that the Fed is engaged in a very good trade, you know, taking uh, the interest rates, you know, they're taking huge amount of risk. They're buying these bonds ready at the peak. They're going to be landed with them at, you know, these bonds are really going to go down once you normalize. You know, I, I wouldn't minimize the kind of problems that they're going to make. Uh, you know, obviously the Fed's not going to mark to market, but uh, they're going to be huge losses involved. The, uh, the, the, the share of what the actual mortgage is being written this day, I, I believe, continues to go up even as the Fed drops the dollar amount that they're purchasing. They're just not dropping it fast enough. It occurs to me that, uh, you know, the Fed is, uh, as we've all mentioned, uh, bidding uh, rates down. It's been bidding rates down for the last several years, and uh, that's uh, kind of what they did back before the crash, too. Question here. Yeah, I've been coming for several years, and it's comforting to know, Desmond, you're still depressed about various things. And of course, every everyone on the panel answering the question of are bubbles back is the answer is yes. Uh, am I correct? In Would you remind us of your name and affiliation? Uh, my name is Bonnie Wachtel, and I work in the stock market. Not our our bubbles are benign, according to Alan Greenspan, since there is they're not heavily leveraged. So uh, I can watch this uh, panel with them um, uh, in a more sanguine light. 
I, are you all of the view that what is going to trigger a negative outcome from the bubbles you observe would be something going on in the, with interest rates? Or would you like to predict what might be the trigger to actually create something of some seriousness in destabilization? Okay, who wants to take a bet? Okay. So in the farm, you know, real estate market in particular, I think it's just not like a financial market. You know, people bid up land prices because they're emotional about land. You know, they've had several good years of income, they've got money to invest, and they just don't want to invest in Wall Street. And, you know, maybe it's hard to criticize them for that instinct. Uh, so instead, they just buy land because that's what they did before. And so maybe it's not a market where you'd expect the price to be, you know, described as a fundamental value. In terms of other markets, you know, at the Fed, we certainly, pre, even pre-crisis, you know, we looked for bubbles or distortions in markets. We look for them today. People differ about, you know, which ones are going on where. One can look at individual stocks and ask whether some of the social media stocks are really worth what they're being priced at. Uh, but, uh, you know, I question whether we should say that asset prices that are high because interest rates are low are in a bubble situation. The question is, are they higher than what the interest rate yield curve implies? Because the yield curve is consistent with the Fed's plan to raise interest rates slowly over time. Uh, and, you know, many people would say that if you've got a reasonable forecast of interest rates and you're pricing your cash flows according to that forecast, then it's not a bubble. Yeah. Thank you, Desmond. I don't want to disappoint you. I, I, I take a, uh, you know, kind of quite a different view, you know, that I think that there's really got to be serious concern that risk is not being priced properly in a whole range of markets. You know, so what I'm thinking about is, you know, whether it's emerging market debt, whether it's the high yield market, whether it's the European sovereign debt market, uh, what you've got is you've got spreads that are far too close for what uh, the risks really are. And when those risks materialize, uh, you know, then all hell will break loose. So to give you just a specific example, you know, what I've been watching uh, the last year and a half, uh, you know, since uh, uh, Draghi made his comment, since the Fed engaged in its third round of quantitative easing in September 2012, is you've seen a progressive deterioration in both the economics and the politics of a whole range of countries in southern Europe, uh, yet at the same time you've seen enormous amount of spread compression going back to levels practically before the crisis. So there's something amiss and you know what anything can trigger it, you know whether it's a Ukrainian event or whether it's a bad uh, election result in Greece or whether it's, uh, you know, some political event in France, you've got uh, many triggers. Uh, but the point I'm making is you're in a situation where the interest rate spreads have got to levels that really don't reflect uh, the risk inherent in those markets. You know, so uh, I think you're going to run into a problem at some stage. You know, when you run into it, I'm not sure because I think that what we very likely have is we have another round of the Japanese and the Europeans, you know, bumping up markets. So, you know, this game can go on for a long time. Chris? Yeah. You know, since you've been here for many of these meetings, I, I think going back to the original theme of the deflating bubble, that's what we're seeing. I don't expect to see any climatic, uh, you know, catastrophic sorts of events that uh, Desmond was talking about for the simple reason that we don't have any credit expansion. You know, a bubble can be described in many ways. You could think of the silver bubble, you know, that Jay Gould and, and uh, you know, his c cohorts tried to instigate during the term of President Grant. Uh, there was a lot of credit behind that, a lot of borrowed money, but we don't have that today. 
there is leverage in the system, but if anything, the system is still deflating. And what the Fed has been trying to do, as I understand it, is try and manage that deflation process so that it's not going too fast and also so that we don't wipe out all the equity in the system. Because let's face it, in 2007, we woke up and most investors fled in horror because they realized that the national and indeed the international balance sheet was out of balance. We had $30 trillion worth of stuff that we didn't think was there the day before. And the central banks, through quantitative easing and, and low rates, have basically been trying to prevent a forced liquidation that would have wiped out the system's equity and then we wouldn't have anything to build on. But my fear is that we're just going to have really slow growth and grotty politics as a result. That's, that, to me, is the future. 2007 eight was we found out we didn't have $7 trillion in wealth that we foolishly thought we did have. I just, well, Chris's point, I'll come to you in just a second, Mark. Chris's point is good, too. The, the deflation of financial market bubbles results in the inflation of the central bank balance sheet that we're observing all around the world. Um, yes, Mark. You asked about uh, triggers, and I was just remembering, uh, you know, the last uh, collapse, what I saw as triggers, uh, you know, as they were happening. And one is, you know, what we used to call creative financing or specialty finance. When it got above 25 percent of the market, I said, this is getting way too hot. And the other thing that I noticed was uh, CalPERS, which is the uh, California state government uh, pension fund, they lifted their uh, mortgage limit to a million dollars. And I said, gee, I didn't know the state workers were doing so well. But, uh, of course, in California, that could have been an affordable housing loan, a million bucks, right? So but those were the two that I saw. Um, go ahead, Jay. Well, just to finish off, you know, so everyone gets to comment on, on the one question in terms of a trigger, uh, to narrow it down just to housing, I'm only capable of worrying about one, one crisis at a time, I guess. But if you look back at the last decade, really what happened was we had a temporary increase in demand based on various things, loose lending, changes in loan policy, stated income loans, all this sort of thing, that temporarily drove up demand relative to a fairly permanent supply. When that temporary demand rolled back to more normal levels, we were then stuck with all this excess supply in the system. I don't see that now uh, in terms of, because credit's still tight, and as Chris says, it's coming back, but we still see, though, a lot of equity investment in housing. So to the extent, if there's a concern out there that I would have is some of the investment that's being made in rental property, whether it's all cash because of what's coming in, what is long-term sustainable on that, how much then are they building up supply, which if anything then turns around in the rental market, or these investors say, we've been in it for two years, it's not making as much money as, you know, pick a dot-com stock or whatever they're doing, and they say, okay, it's no longer in housing, they all flee who then gets stuck with having to liquidate all that supply? I think that's sort of the potential as a trigger on the housing side, not the, the lending piece that we saw 10 years ago. What would, I, to anybody on the panel, what would a 100 basis point rise uh, in long rates, including mortgage rates, uh, do to the housing market if it happened over the next year or so? Well, you know, it's funny. Historically, rates aren't really that high, but we now have all these structural impediments. Um, you know, for example, the CFPB has decided that a high-priced loan is 6.5%. Uh, I think at some point, they, they took this from some old Fed uh, research literature, and I think eventually they're going to have to change that definition into a spread over the 10-year Treasury because it just doesn't work. Um, you know, you have other structural impediments that are making lenders less uh, uh, willing to lend. So, you know, to me, rates, the media fixates on this, but I think jobs, income, and the propensity of lenders to now basically avoid creating assets that have a high probability of default and thereby attract the attention of regulators, I think those are really the reasons we're not seeing uh, the kind of lending volumes that we've So like. not so much impact. Any other no. comments? 100 basis no. points up? Uh, you know, it might be obvious to say, but uh, you know, refinancings have been reduced, but there's still a big part of the market, and a 100 basis point rate would, would just curtail them a lot further. Uh, <clears throat> interest rates are, are cap, uh, capitalized or, uh, in the home price, so I think what you'll see is the same unit volume, maybe with a slight decrease as, in, as buyers sort of get adjusted to the new rates, but what you're likely to see is a move toward cheaper houses, smaller loans, 
uh, the, you know, the driver of a home purchase is not the interest rate, it's the second child in one bathroom, and you've got to get someplace else. That will continue, but they're not going to be moving up perhaps to the $400,000 house, $1,000 house, perhaps they'll be looking at the $300,000 house or whatever it is based on whatever market. So I think it's going to be more in the effect of home prices and demand in particular price niches. Other questions from uh, all of you who are so good to be with us today? If not, uh, we really appreciate your coming, and let's thank our outstanding panel. <laughs>